Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and thank you everybody for attending our webinar here talking about flexible order management in our continuing series on the digital solutions economy. Uh, I am privileged to be joined uh, by two super smart, super uh, talented folks uh, who have a lot of experience in this space. Ken Christ from SAP. Ken, uh, welcome. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Yes, and Sunil Gintella. Sunil has been working with Bramasol now on a number of different projects, brings some deep expertise in this space. Um, looking at order management is currently working on a solution with one of our large customers uh, who is really, I guess, Sunil, you'd call it right in the middle of this. So welcome to you too. Thank you, glad to be here. All right, so everybody, this is going to be a one of our fireside chat formats. We're gonna talk through some uh, great issues and uh, talk through kind of what, what people are thinking about as they go through this process. As always, um, we are recording this webinar, so feel free to share uh, throughout your organization or with others in your organization. You can ask questions throughout the session. There's a little questions box down there and you feel free to click in there. We will answer uh, or address as many of those questions as we can. Uh, and then um, for those that we don't, we will follow up with you directly. Um, you can see that you can download all of these presentations uh, from the web. You can visit us at bramasol.com. Uh, and again, just like on our last webinar, uh, Bramasol is celebrating 25 years of serving our clients. So thanks to SAP, our clients, and others uh, for supporting us now for 25 years. You can engage with us through Facebook. We have a Facebook page. Uh, LinkedIn, we get a lot of conversation going. Check out all of our LinkedIn groups, by the way, around different areas such as BRIM, Solution Management, Treasury, and others. We have a YouTube channel. I believe we have almost 150 videos up on our web, our YouTube channel of all kinds of different varying types. Uh, so check those out. You'll get a lot of great insights there. And speaking of insights, our Insight to Actions and other podcasts are available through uh, Apple iTunes and iHeartRadio. So we look forward to uh, having you join the conversation. So uh, let's take a pause a moment. I'd like uh, Ken and uh, Sunil to introduce themselves, give you their background and tell you a little bit about you know, why are we here to discuss this. We'll then dive into the digital solutions economy to set the context and background so you have that. And then we'll took it to this idea of customer driven solutions creation, order management and commerce, and then connecting it all up. And finally, we'll wrap up um, with some commentary or final thoughts from Ken and Sunil and um, take look forward to your questions. So let's take a moment. Ken, um, why don't you introduce yourself? Take about a minute or two just to introduce yourself, please. Yeah, thanks, John. Uh, my name is Ken Christ. I'm based here in New Jersey. Uh, I'm with SAP since 2006. So in that 15 years, I've been focusing on uh, customer monetization challenges around uh, billing around next generation monetization models, as well as the customer experience with different stints in our uh, CRM and CX divisions as well. Uh, probably have been focused on billing or customer engagement throughout my 25 plus year career in various instances. So great to be participating today. And, uh, you know, I come from a third generation telco background so I, I like to refer to myself as having a bell-shaped head but i try and apply <laughs> some of that lesson learned as we go forward looking for our I, looking forward to our conversation today i hear you and i forgot that that's something we have in common i started at at t right after divestiture so i've got a mini bell-shaped head so awesome sunil welcome um you and i talk a lot about different opportunities and solutions here why don't you introduce yourself thank you john hey this is sunil here sunil gentella Based out of Bay Area, I've been in the SAP space for uh, more than 17 years now. I've been helping customers uh, uh, implement SAP solutions. Uh, I'm a solution architect. Basically started off with OTC, then implemented BRIM solutions and then RAR solutions. So uh, currently working with a large customer of uh, Bramasol, where we are actually helping uh, uh, build all the subscription business uh, within SAP and then uh, the revenue recognition. 
And I have to, <clears throat> just a quick comment, uh, Sunil, your, our conversations about that customer that you're working on sort of actually inspired together with some conversations with Ken, this whole idea of the webinar. So, um, you know, I'm ex ex eager and excited to have you both here. So I'm gonna really quickly touch on this idea of the digital solutions economy, just to give everybody perspective. When we talk about this, we're talking about the next evolution of the subscription economy. And I think we're all very familiar with the idea of the subscription economy. Um, you know, that goes way back. And Ken, you and I know from the bell-shaped head days where you subscribed, you had a phone bill, you paid your monthly service. Generally speaking, of course, it was a, it was a, a usage or consumption-based model, but um, you know, over time that evolved. Um, but now we're seeing more and more evolution into different models. Uh, SAP is a great example of that with its RISE program, business transformation. Uh, as a service, but you also have many other companies not only offering um, technical solutions, but really almost anything as a service these days. You also have the idea of entitlements management where you have companies where you buy something from them, digital assets, for example, and you're entitled to downloads. Games are a great example, but video content, um, software, any of that. Um, networking equipment, there's all kinds of different entitlements you might have to usage on that. Dynamic pricing models such as Uber, uh, but you know, in the air industries and others, we've been seeing that a lot. Um, Outcome-based models, companies like Lexmark, HP, HPE, and others, um, you don't buy the printer, you buy the number of pages that you print. Um, another company that we're dealing with um, really is focused on um, cement mixers. Uh, and devices for cement mixers. And they don't charge for the device in the cement mixer, they charge by the outcome, the number of uh, cubic yards of cement that's poured out. We have usage-based, we're all familiar with usage-based and consumption-based models. And then this idea of revenue sharing models. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that um, because we have a customer in particular uh, that we're dealing with that has an interesting revenue sharing model uh, and we see this more and more as companies offer their services and products through larger aggregators, um, you know, or companies, you know, like um, Ingram Micro or Insight or uh, Amazon, Google, uh, Apple, and others where I sell my services through a network and I'm sharing revenue with them. So those are all different models. Here's some of the companies that are out there doing those models. Uh, and we'll dive into this. There's a lot more information on our website. Uh, check out, we have some, some really good podcasts and videos uh, on the web more about the digital solutions economy. But as we look at the digital solutions economy, we really see this as a ring of customer engagement. And what we mean by that is we see our customers really focused in driving this customer engagement, everything through the moment that they think about how I want to engage with you as a company. Do I want to be recognized? Do I want to not be recognized? Do I want to see my own experience where you bundle together my own offers and information? And how do I become eligible for what I can look at? Focusing through that, using that engagement to create dynamic solutions and create those solutions, manage them, and then ultimately push the button uh, for commerce, right? If you think of um, Amazon as an interesting um, benchmark, because we all know that. Think about when you go into Amazon, you might have uh, Amazon Prime, or you might be just a regular Amazon or, an, or a guest and how you create your bundles or how you create things and you put them into your shopping cart. And then you can shop for them, um, get different shipping, get different types of models, how you want to pay for them, different credit cards, PayPal, et cetera. Then you push the button and you expect flexible delivery and fulfillment. Customers in um, the high-tech industry, everything from the high-tech music industry, um, medical device, all the same idea. We want flexible delivery and fulfillment on our own terms. We wanna know when and where it's going to come and we wanna be able to dictate that. Amazon, you don't want 32 different bills from the 32 different little companies you might have ordered from. You get a single bill from Amazon uh, on your credit card statement usually. Um, and you can make choices about that invoicing and of course our customers want that too. You have the idea of flexible payments and collections. Uh, driving that. Um, how do I want to pay? Do I want to pay all up front, pay over time? 
uh, collections? Do you want to give me an opportunity to take advantage of discounts? And of course, all of that, again, relates to all of these areas. And finally, privacy and security. Um, how are you securing your customers' data? When we think of the Amazon model, for example, but there are plenty of others, the Amazon model where you go in and you pay for things, you want your privacy um, as best you can these days, but you want your privacy protected, particularly when it comes to um, if you're ordering healthcare products, your private health information, your personal information, your credit card information, you want to make sure that there, it's a secure transaction and you're minimizing the risk. And risk can be, by the way, not just the traditional risk we think of for hacking, but think about risk. I want to try something out. What's my return policy? And of course, return policy then relates to all of these different areas. For us, we're really going to focus today on solution creation, order management, and commerce. Uh, we'll have different videos and different uh, events available to you as we walk through this circle. So look for more uh, upcoming videos, particularly in the area we've talked already about RevRec and compliance. Um, but today we're going to focus with this great team on solution creation, order management, and commerce. So with that, I created this kind of a quick diagram to kind of to assess and think about this process. And I'm going to ask. Um, Sunil and Ken to comment a little bit on this in a moment. Um, but let's think of this, this process. We talked about the idea of customer engagement, where the customer engages with you and comes in. And then they start this process of solution creation. They want to view the items. Um, they want to then assemble their solution, look at the pricing and delivery, and then review. It's sort of this cycle. And if you think of the way we buy things, you know, you look at them and say, ah, oh, do I want that? No, I don't like the delivery. What if I assemble it and get different pricing? Could I rebundle? And you, you go through this iterative process. And then finally, of course, you click here, click to order, and we go into the fulfillment process. It's not just the fulfillment process. And Ken, you pointed this out the other day, and I'll ask you, know, you to start maybe comment about this as a holistic um, area and maybe some of the things you're seeing with customers you talk to, but you rightfully pointed out that fulfillment is just purely one aspect of all of the downstream items that have to happen almost simultaneously. Um, and they all need to be linked together, whether it's the fulfillment, billing, invoicing, credit payment, all of that uh, has to happen. So let me pause for a minute, Ken. Um, thought, thoughts? Yeah, I mean, when we start this off and we, you know, we're talking about this idea of recurring revenue streams. So we know that the monetization model is fundamentally one of the core components that's changing here. And as part of that, we're merging together combinations of products and services with that monetization model. That's where that complexity comes in from what happens downstream. Because you, you might even think about the fact that they could probably buy those products and services a la carte from you as a vendor. They could also maybe buy, buy them together as a bundle, but pay up front. But it's when you start to talk about the recurring revenue stream that you have more of that interlocking taking place, right? So if, you're, if you have anything as a service, then you might imagine that I have a piece of equipment that needs to be picked, packed, and shipped to the customer. I might need to, uh, at worst, dispatch a technician to assemble it or install it on site, or maybe it's even just to calibrate the device or, or just to attach it to the network because we're going to be reporting uh, IoT data that's used for consumption. All of those methodologies then say, well, before I can start my revenue relationship, I have to make sure that the equipment was shipped, the technician, whether on site or remote, could make sure that that was aligned with how we were going to measure it and then i activate the subscription from there and then that starts to generate downstream billing and that can be a mix and match even on the billing side of saying well i'm not going to give the equipment fully rolled into the subscription i'm going to subsidize you know part of that cost and part of it will be paid up front exactly. so you might have multiple items that end up flowing down to that first invoice for the customer and then it's a question of, well, what gets billed to the customer when? You know, do I have the ability to say, put it all on that first invoice and then start the recurring stream from there? 
But those are some of the questions that we roll into from this notion of solution creation becomes, well, what are the components of my bundle that I want to have switches and levers that are available for the customer to choose? How does that affect not only pricing for the monetization, but perhaps how that product is uh, manufactured or how it's installed, et cetera, and so on. So those, those are all key concerns as you go into that process. Yeah, and we'll, we'll dive into each of these, uh, some of these key areas in, in a little more detail in a moment, but spot on, you know, and as you said that, I think of, you know, um, you're not just selling, think of the piece of, we think of the pick, pack and ship of a piece of equipment, but it could very well be in many cases that you run a network center and all I'm doing is allocating space in a rack or a server to a particular individual. How do I provision that, set that up, manage that? And then, you know, what are the services that go with that? So, you know, absolutely, it's, it's just such a change um, in the way we think about things. So, you know, you're working on a, on a project with a large, um, high-tech company, recently acquired a software company. Um, what's your experience and what are you seeing some of, you know, how this relates to them? Yeah, I mean, uh, adding to what Ken has just said on the monetization part, especially how we will build the bundles and how the products are being offered, uh, especially on the media side, uh, we are seeing a lot of cases, I mean, a lot of scenarios where uh, monetization is owned by the company uh, which is uh, providing the service and sometimes monetization is owned by a third party for example exactly. uh, you you subscribe to uh, uh, let's say uh, today xfinity i mean i'm an xfinity customer and then mm -hmm. uh, they they give me peacock free you know i'm a peacock subscriber and then uh, the billing is happening through xfinity but ultimately peacock is getting the uh, revenue so you 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 have these kind of models like you you get billed through uh, uh, Apple, you know, uh, for a subscription which is uh, uh, which belongs to say Disney Plus. So how how these offerings and how the monetization is happening and how we are recognizing revenue within SAP, uh, there are different models and how we are uh, building these models within uh, the overall product offerings, how they are being presented to the customer and how they are handled within SAP. Uh, a lot of things are changing and how we are changing ourselves to meet those uh, uh, varied requirements. Uh, that's that's the challenge. Yeah, yeah, and you 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 point that out so well in 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 the media space that you're you're focused in in particular. The world is changing. You know, I think of, um, you know, just a few years ago, you know, it was all about, um, you know, a few years ago, a decade ago, or a few years ago, it was about your cable TV that moved from regular TV to cable TV, and how you subscribe to channels and what was that subscription, and you know, now it's all about the combination of subscriptions and streaming and exactly. providing dynamic content. And by the way, I can buy that streaming content that's licensed. For example, you mentioned Disney, but, you know, Disney or, you know, Major League Baseball or FIFA or any of those, you have licensing. And how do you bundle that together and think about what are customers eligible for, not eligible for? Um, you know, and, and, you know, there's a lot to that. So with that, let's dive in. Um, let's talk, we're going to take kind of these in individually. And I'm going to start with this idea of viewing items. And we'll take this from a couple of perspectives. Let's start with the idea of the customer facing side of this, right? Because there's two general aspects. The number one is as customers come in and view these items, they have this idea of bundling. They want to view items. There's this idea that I'm connecting customer data to the solution presentation. Part of that has to do with what do I know about you and what did you have um, available to you? What have you ordered in the past? Then you have the flexibility in offer presentation. Um, and how many different offers do I want to present? What's the right scale? What's happening? And then the upsell cross-sell opportunities. Um, and on the back end, what we call the back end or the back space, and, and we'll, let's talk about this and how they fit together, is this idea of rules engines. How do you map the core solutions to the bundles? Do you create infinite scenario? I mean, you, you think about you know, companies that offer multiple channels of, of content or offer hundreds of different kinds of, or dozens of different kinds of um, software solutions or software services and hardware 
solutions? And then how do you combine them together? What are the rules engines? Ken, you talked about the levers. Um, and what do we consider? I think it's interesting to discuss, what do we consider viable bundles? So maybe Sunil, you can start with, with start this conversation around what are you seeing? What are some of the elements that you're hearing from the customers we're dealing with and their end customers? And then Ken, you can kind of add to that. Sure. So yeah, the, the bundling, uh, uh, again, going back to media as an example, uh, where a lot of these now come with a hardware bundling too. I mean, uh, earlier, they are purely like a subscription, but now they are also talking about shipping out a, uh, a box, like a uh, their own box, which works like a, a Roku box or something like that, or a Fire, Fire TV stick. So uh, the bundling of the hardware products with the subscription services and how you are presenting, because customer gets these options. And when you are presenting all your services on the uh, a web page where customer, on your B2C portals, or, or in some cases the B2B portals, how customers are able to log in uh, to these portals and select these options and how dynamically pricing is getting calculated and what uh, how, how, the, how the rules are set up in, in SAP so that the, these uh, to the front end, the customer gets uh, the flexibility to pick and choose what he wants and how uh, uh, the, the, cal the calculation of the prices is happening. Uh, that's that's one of the key key aspects of the bundles, and we are seeing a great change in a lot of these customers going into that mode, you know. And and of course, as I said earlier, uh, the some of these where uh, uh, we don't even uh, do the monetization, it's purely the back end how we are recognizing these uh, uh, revenues within SAP. Uh, absolutely, and I think you know you talked about the media industry and and media, and of course we always think of media, you know, as um, movies, music, um, broadcast type media, but this applies just as much to other media like um, news, um, education in some ways, or um, um, our traditional book publishers, content publishers, they all have the same issue, right? Exactly, and even somebody who is into offering uh, uh, space data, you know? I mean, there are companies which are offering data. There are co uh, companies which are offering online services. Uh, so they also are shipping out hardware and it's not just the, uh, and some of some of the times this hardware is free. Some of the times the hardware is built to the customer. And then how you are building all of this into the subscription model, you know? Uh, exactly. Ken, you were gonna say something? Yeah, I was going to say, you know, I, I don't want us to lose sight of the fact that there is a differentiation here with the concepts that are presented from a B2B space as opposed to a B2C space. Now, absolutely, right. everything you said about media or Amazon and, and how that user experience is influencing the way vendors go to market for B2B is absolutely true. But underneath the covers, there is differentiation, right, in how you apply these things. And so for an example, that idea of guided selling is differentiated between what you do in a B2B space versus what you might do in a B2C space. And I think you were kind of guiding that more towards a, a B2C type of approach. Oh, here's what I bought before, et cetera, and so on. Not that that doesn't apply to B2B, but guided selling there is much more of what are you? What problems are you trying to solve? What are you trying to accomplish? And how do the rules then guide you to which of the various solutions might you want to know more about and get into that, right? So I think exactly. that's part of it. The second piece of that, of course, is I would differentiate the rules engines from what is a rules uh, engine that's really driving the notion of sales configuration. How do I pick the products from a, you know, a catalog to put into a bill of materials to work together to make the solution. And then when we look at that at another level of complexity, that might actually also have rules that need to determine how do I build the piece of equipment that goes with our recurring revenue? How do I maybe assemble it, right? So that idea of level of complexity between selling configuration versus build or assemble configuration, I think also needs to be taken into account. Um, yeah, it, right? it's the old idea of available, you know, maybe the old idea of available to, pro you know, what can be variant config and available to, pro what can be mapped and how do you manufacture it, right? 
Right, but the beautiful thing about these front end tools is also having those rules in place, they should be thought of as not only getting the right products at the right price, but then also the guardrails. What don't I want to allow to happen? Or where do I want to introduce oversight? And you think of things with CPQ tools where you have approval flows, those become key consideration to say, I want to give maximum amount of flexibility either to my customer or to my salesperson working with that customer to come up with that bundle or that solution. But at a certain point, we know that they've stepped over a threshold and someone else needs to provide some oversight or something else needs to be done before that takes place. And I think that's an additional element of the rules engines that folks really need to, to think about as part of this. Yeah, and exactly. And I think, Ken, that you hit on the, the idea of what I was thinking of in this idea of the levers. What are these different levers or knobs and dials that you can turn in order to give the customer as much as possible a sense of what they can do, but it still has to be profitable and doable. And how do you play with those levers behind the scenes from, from that perspective and what's available, whether you're using you know, all the different, as you man, ma mentioned, the different manufacturing models, if you do an engineer to order, you know, like Dell, really, you know, Dell is a great example of an engineer to order, whether it's a, a B2B or a B2C model, very much the same kind of a process, right? right. What, where we see differentiation, John, though, is in the idea of monetization. Because yes. now, not only are you thinking about how I might modify the recurring charge versus the one-time upfront charge, there might also be entitlements in there that I can use as another level. Oh, how much can I do with this particular service that I'm subscribing to? will determine what my recurring charge is or what my overage charge is or how much is included. Those all become different ways to manipulate the price to get the customer into the relationship and maybe even start them off at one level that went, becomes more advantageous with upsell and cross-sell, which is you see here on the list, to say, I started off here, but very quickly realized I'm taking advantage of this application, but it's costing me an overage. I can go to a more advantageous plan based upon the fact that I'm really you know, exploiting the capabilities that that service is bringing to me. Spot on. And of course, from a, from a, we, we talked about this statutory, you hinted at that. And of course, you know, uh, we, we, one of the reasons we got involved so deeply in this space, as you well know, Ken, is our expertise in revenue recognition of what we do. It's that connection. Um, and how are these bundles then linked back into how do I, manage that revenue and balance all of those things together, right? And Sunil, right. I think you're seeing a lot of that too, right? Yeah, go ahead, Ken. Absolutely, that's become a key consideration in going to these models is understanding, okay, if I'm rolling this up into a subscription, but I'm supplying services as well as hard goods, you know, the new regulations with ASC 606, IFRS Reg 15, are all pointing to this idea of what are the standard selling prices of the components that make up that bundle, because I need to take those into consideration when I do revenue recognition. I can't just assume that even though that piece of equipment might cost $600 and I you know, say that it's $1, that I just recognize $1. No, it has to take the 600 into account. So there's a level of complexity introduced on the back end that the customer never sees, but right. is a big concern to finance that needs to be built into the end-to-end -end consideration of this uh, approach. Absolutely. Absolutely. And as customers take their offers to market, we're working with a large telco right now where they want to re significantly reduce by an order of magnitude the amount of time it takes to take offers to the marketplace, but they have to consider RevRec. And, and that's a big um, initiative that companies certainly need to be thinking about. And John, adding adding there is uh, uh, the high tech industry where you have this uh, uh, bundling and how do you, especially when you have uh, usage based billing and how do you estimate your usage and how do you uh, estimate the revenue over the duration of the contract? You know, uh, ultimately we have to meet the AC 606 standards and we'll have to estimate that revenue to be able to perform the allocations among the different performance obligations. Uh, there could be a hardware performance obligation and you would have your service performance obligations and how you are allocating revenues and how you are triggering these revenue recognition events mm -hmm. at different points of time. Those are those are the key aspects of uh, uh, revenue recognition when it comes to uh, high tech industry and of course uh, other industries too. Absolutely. Great. So 
now that now we've talked a bit about how do we help customers when a B2B, B2C space, they're viewing the items. The next step is, okay, so now the customer wants to assemble those. And from a customer facing perspective, how do you bundle and what is and what is not changeable, right? You create bundles, but what can you uh, change? And you talk, Ken, about the integration of products, services, and digital content, pricing, um, what are, and, and what are terms and conditions? On the back end, it's the, again, this idea of what are the rules engines? What's the focus on the pricing and bundling? Trade-offs and levers, connect T's and C's. We talk about this all the time, but what about credit checks, payment terms, taxes, and you know the detailed POBs and actual products being sold? Because sometimes what we present from a customer facing perspective Again, let's say we're selling a, a piece of network equipment and it comes with software, hardware itself, service, warranties, upgrades. We may only sell or show the customer one item, line item, but that line item is composed of many different things behind the scenes. So, Ken, any thoughts on that? Well, you know, the one thing I was going to hone into was that idea of you know, T's and C's are typically things that are wrapped up. I think of them more on a, on a B2B side as having more importance because that's something that people will go through a red line process, like contract lifecycle management, that type of thing, than yep. something that's just packaged along with signing up for the subscription. But the main thing to keep in mind here is we're looking for starting an ongoing contractual relationship. That means fundamentally, I'm moving from traditional you know, item-based accounting where I send you an invoice and then that invoice becomes past due to now a contractual relationship where I'm really using, you know, balance forward accounting and saying, well, no, I have how much I was supposed to pay last month, how much I'm going to pay this month. And I need to be able to also invoice and track that from the perspective of, you know, how that affects credit management, how that affects uh, collections because it's more of an outstanding balance rather than an outstanding invoice. And that that's a little bit of a different shift for from an ERP perspective that a lot of customers have to adapt to, to say, well, now I really need to manage my revenue stream as something that's ongoing. As far right. as, as far as the, you know, the integration of, of the products, uh, what I like to think of is when I'm building my product in the product catalog, and I think of this more in terms of the monetization model, right? I want to define it in such a way that that understands what are the parameters that I can set. We talked about this already, the price, the entitlements, the length of the contract, et cetera, and so on. All those things might be parameterized. But right. the rules for that really is something that ties more towards the tool that's much more customer facing. So I want to have the engine in the background say, you're going to, I, I have my defaults. I know how to operate in that environment, but I'm also fully expecting that you might send me overrides off of what those defaults are. So I'm ready for that as well. But the rules as far as what's allowed and what's not allowed really should happen as close to that customer facing channel as possible, because mm -hmm. you might have different rules based upon different markets, different customers, at, you know, different segments, what have you. And that all needs to be very, very nimble. But the back end just needs to say, go and apply the rules to see what's allowed. When you figure that out, send me the results. And I will now manage that ongoing contractual relationship for the length of that customer lifecycle. And oh, by the way, be prepared for the upsell, cross-sell, and renewal flows that are going to happen as part of that ongoing lifecycle. Yeah, and what, what's also interesting is the tiered pricing too. And we see this, of course, uh, with SAP, right? SAP has tiered pricing for software depending on, um, you know, in some cases, the number of subscription uh, that you're processing or the number of transactions and invoices you might process or rental units or all of that. Um, but the reason I bring it up is because as you think of the connection here, it's important to understand, does this customer have a tiered pricing model and has this individual now moved to a different level? How does that all relate? And of course, the complexity, you have to link it all the way back through your ERP, right? Yeah, and, and I think you also need to take into the concept, into effect the concept of 
customer communications. If they are rolling over to an overage situation or rolling into an, an, another tier, whether it's more expensive or less expensive for them to do that, the concept should be how and when should the customer be notified of that? Right. right? And, and so the concept of a, of a customer facing entity really starts to take on more of a portal notification and then say, all right, mm -hmm. now I can go in here, see how I'm using that. Maybe there will be other notifying factors in there to tell me, oh, I've now moved from this tier to the other, or I have this system in the back end analyzing that as it's going through the pricing and you know, in real time, sending out some type of communication to that customer's email address to say, oh, you know, glad to see you're using XYZ service, just to let you know you've rolled into a more advantageous tier and you can take advantage of the new lower pricing, it's things like that, right? That becomes Absolutely. another communication channel that's part of that customer facing engagement tied to things like tiers, which might have their own negotiated breakpoints or their own negotiated tier prices as part of how you go to that, especially in the B2B space. Absolutely, absolutely. Sunil, any thoughts from you? Yeah, on, on the B2B space, the challenge is uh, the complex price plans and how you are building those price plans into uh, the overall solutioning. And that is where a lot of uh, customers are facing challenges and how dynamically, you know, you can adjust your uh, price plans in such a way that the customer gets billed the proper way. You don't want the customers to reject the invoice at, at the end of the day. And that's where uh, when you are dealing with uh, uh, high volume billing uh, using the BRIM solution and you want uh, you you don't want the customers to point out issues in the invoices and the invoices getting rejected. And these, these charge plans play a big role. Uh, the price plans uh, play a big role in getting that uh, uh, to the customer in a proper way. Yeah, Sunil, even leveraging that further in the B2B space saying, well, you know, if I'm going to be uh, selling to an enterprise customer, we might want to pre-negotiate the pricing for the services that they're going to be rolling out within their enterprise. Exactly. And that means two things. Number one, I want to have well, well, what we call a master agreement that says, here are the products that I want preferential pricing on and be able to break that down so that other entities of my organization automatically get that pricing when they order. But then as, as a part of that, I might also say that enterprise that we're doing business with might want hierarchical based invoicing, which is a particularly tricky situation where you could imagine that maybe all of the recurring charges for the services being used are rolled up and paid at the, the home office, but all overage charges might be paid at every field office as an example. And being able to enable those type of things as part of how do I go to market for an enterprise customer where I'm not really selling it once, I'm negotiating it once and selling it many times over the course of the relationship with that enterprise customer. You know, that really comes exactly. up. Yeah, another example is aggregates. You know, you have to, uh, especially when it comes to usage-based billing, some of the customer agreements are in such a way that they group a particular number of assets together and they, they want to cover the usage on all of those assets as an aggregated usage and bill and the charge plans have to uh, bill based on that aggregated usage you know so these these kind of complexities also are there and there are uh, the customer requirements are changing end of the day you know each one wants the flexibility to be there and how we can meet those uh, flexible requirements yeah, no, absolutely. And of course, you when you talk, Ken, about the differences between the, the actual plan and the overages, you could even have that to the extent that the individual devices are charged to one organization or one one place, um, you know, IT, let's say, but the plan and the usage uh, and network charges might be charged to the individual business units. So again, that flexibility, that hierarchical structure, Another interesting piece that we've run into recently, particularly on the lessor side of things where you're leasing uh, large items that might have um, requirements for repairs or modifications, who pays what and what part of that charge. And as you think about the bundling and these offers, who pays for what, um, whether it's the in the customer or maybe it's the customer and a combination of the customer and you as a business, all things that have to be connected on the back end, right? That's right. I mean, you have the concept of a service uh, contract, if you will, that says, what am I entitled to? So we talk about entitlements. Service has its own set of entitlements. You know, is it seven by 24 coverage for answering your questions? Is it eight by five? 
uh, are all parts covered are certain parts covered at a certain percentage and of course when you now start to see that being rolled into a subscription monetization then that might say well all of that under these rules is included in what you pay for your subscription or even that there are consumable parts or replenishment programs rolled into that exactly. as well so that those all become new triggers and new things built into the architecture that looks at what am i entitled to from a service perspective service management as well as the service that i'm providing in terms of entitlements for the monetization that i'm paying and then being able to use that to drive triggers as far as who gets paid what a great example is in the managed print services that you talked about before yeah. mm -hmm. i might not provide the third party service to have someone go out and fix the printer that we're offering you a managed service plan for that third party vendor sends me an invoice i look at that invoice to say well is there something that the customer needs to pay because they're under a managed service program and maybe it wasn't covered under their entitlements and if not then how much of that also do i pay back to that vendor as part of the subscription and managing all that. So we see those kind of dynamics as well. We talked about going to market with partners and revenue sharing. Well, there's a case where we're actually looking at, you know, how I fulfill the service aspects and reimburse our partners for. No, spot on. And I think we see that in the oil and gas industry too, particularly the ones of the oil service industries where, you know, you look at the, the companies that provide services to uh, offshore drilling or, onshore drilling and manage and service the well heads the pumping stations all of that where do you bundle that together are you providing maybe you're providing pricing on the number of hours that it runs or you're providing pricing on the um barrels of oil that are pumped but it also in, and and you're you have a, sub, a base subscription fee with a usage fee and then there's some wear normal wear and tear that's included but if your guy backs his truck into the oil well hey that's on you how do you you know that's that's all great absolutely and of course you know we look at the different tools and solutions you know we haven't talked a lot a lot about the tools and solutions themselves um maybe you guys can touch you know sap offers a lot of different solutions and of course we know there are third-party solutions what should people be thinking about from that perspective well, I'll, I'll go first and just say, you know, the first one is depending upon your industry, the concept of a customer portal might be one of the first things you think of is how do I face my customers? This is especially true in B2C, but we see it in B2B as well. Uh, and sometimes even like B2B to C markets where we want to enable this idea of a one-stop shop where yes, I can start a new relationship with my customer but I also want to enable them to see where they stand in the ongoing life cycle of that relationship and make changes to it, whether it be you know, strictly a renewal or something like upsell and cross-sell. How do I enable the portal to give them a view of, here's where I am, here's are the things that might be of advantage to me, and here's how I can start that change process. So that's one of the key things to think of is it's not necessarily just a a front-end sales tool. It really is a lifecycle management tool as part of that idea of a customer portal. Perfect, absolutely. You know, Sunil, talk a little bit, because this inspired me. This is the part that I was inspired to talk about this when you talk. You know, if we think of SAP, but you can be SAP, can be third-party solutions. You know, there are other companies who, who make some pretty adequate products, I guess. Um, but from an SAP view, you certainly have many solutions like, um, subscription order management, you have SAP CPQ, you have variant configuration, you have S, you know, SAP SD, and I'm speaking Sapanese here, but overall, you know, what is it that people should be considering and thinking about? And of course, Ken layer on top of that, you know, in, in a moment too, what are some of the trade-offs and con considerations they should be thinking about as they look at these tools? One thing is, I mean, uh, There'll be a lot of uh, uh, the existing systems, whatever customers are using, and how many of these systems are they replacing with uh, SAP systems. It's not necessary that every system, whatever you have, there is probably a better solution and SAP solution. There might be a better SAP product for sure, but we have to consider the other aspects like the implementation and the complexity involved there in replacing it. So we are seeing customers, I mean, uh, where uh, they, they decide to use some of the 
uh, existing legacy systems, non-SAP systems, and how they can interface that with SAP. But with the subscriptions economy, what we are seeing is uh, uh, as and when the customers are looking at a real growth and the number of subscriber base is growing, uh, they, the need for switching over to SAP subscription order management is, uh, is being seen a lot. I mean, a lot of customers are uh, preferring to move to this uh, subscription order management. It becomes quite uh, uh, easy once, we, once the implementation is done. Uh, it's all all the uh, uh, scalable, especially the scalability with respect to the number of customers increasing over a period of time and how we are meeting those challenges. They become easier when we talk about subscription order management. And of course, uh, the statutory part of it has to be considered. And that is where uh, we are seeing the customers very happy with the way uh, the SAP tools perform when it comes to um, uh, meeting those requirements, the, the the revenue requirements, and some of the invoicing requirements. But again, uh, there are there are third party tools, especially in some countries. We see that uh, uh, there are there are challenges, and that's where it's it makes sense to you know leverage the uh, third party tools and integrate with those uh, uh, systems for for getting your some of the statutory invoicing requirements. Uh, but uh, when when the customers are planning their product mix, they will have to see how best they can leverage. Uh, these SAP tools and the SAP products uh, into their into their current space. You know, it's not necessary that uh, they the a SAP product, even though it may be good, not necessary that it should be replaced. But they, on the other hand, uh, some of your systems which are uh, uh, which are outdated definitely have to be replaced. And there are there are a lot of products in SAP space. I mean, SAP product mix which which play a great role. So I'm 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 a big proponent of solution on uh, the subscription order management. How how the uh, the the brim solution and and of course there are different uh, models depending on the size of the customer and then as we can always have that uh, interactions with sap to decide on uh, what the product mix should be sure. from the from the sap perspective you know one of the best things about the subscription order management approach is that it really creates one product catalog for all of your products services and subscriptions that are then fulfilled downstream via SAP. So it directly ties in with service management. It directly ties in with the sales and distribution functionality, directly ties in with the rest of the BRIM platform for the subscription. And I can capture a single document at the front end of this process that allows me to then break off those individual streams and have them all part of that financial audit trail downstream. Now, nothing's made me happier that in the move from our ECC generation of ERP to S4, we also rewrote the subscription order management to take advantage of publicly declared APIs on the front end. So what Sunil was saying about taking advantage of existing components, existing front end components is now easier than ever because of the fact that we've now kind of recreated that interface, acknowledging that there's a world in front of SAP sometimes, and we need to be able to exchange information upstream as far as the product catalog as well as what those completed orders are and then be able to fulfill that yeah, the and back end, yeah. just really quickly the fact that we have uh, the ability to plug in at multiple levels and Sneil also was alluding to this i believe you know whether you're starting and saying i need to start a new subscription that i'm pricing through the sap brim platform or you're saying i have priced and rated transactions that I want to get on an invoice with all my other goods and services, we have convergent invoicing, and that's another input point. Or you say, I've already invoiced this, but I want to manage one AR for all of these things in my environment. A yeah. single RIM implementation can have those multiple endpoints from AR invoicing as well as you know order management, all simultaneously to fit into a true heterogeneous environment where you know one exists. Absolutely, and, and we'll talk at some point about some of the modern um, impl uh, uh, automation tools like GRIR automation and think about what you just said, Ken, and now that you have a customer paying all one bill and now you have to map these two together, it's kind of hard if you have disparate systems. It's much easier when you combine them. With with that in mind, I want to I want to keep moving. Um, and, and you guys know me, I could talk about this subject all day. It's, such, it's so great, but let's talk about, here we've gone through the entire process, right? The customers finally picked out what they want. They came over, they pressed the, the button. 
what do you want, you know, what do we say about downline? Because I think we've talked a lot about what happens in this space, but there's an acknowledgement of the order, but now things have to happen behind the scenes. And sometimes I think we we miss that with the excitement of the front end. Ken, you know, you and I have talked about this a few times. You know, it's like what happens in, in, in the details on the fulfillment? You talked about it earlier about the manufacturing or the available to promise or shipping. Um, how do you integrate the fulfillment engines, the physical versus and with the digital and the billing and invoicing, order track, tracking um, and the connections? What are you seeing customers talking about, um, struggling with and, and what advice do we have for them? Yeah, again, in talking about the levers being pulled, one of those levers is when do I activate my financial relationship with the customer? So the fulfillment streams absolutely have to take place in order to enable you to be you know, properly billing your customer. And so there's a signal being generated, if not from within that order fulfillment directly, say within ERP, then from some external system that's handling registrations or network activations. And we need to be able to bring that in. So there's a concept here with all of these digital solutions of mediation. And that's how does right. this signaling from the outside world make an impact on that ultimate fulfillment stream that says, I can start charging the customer. And so we look at that and saying, is it something internal that we understand that this has taken place? Or is it something that's coming from external, like a license key has been generated and delivered to the customer? or a device has been activated on the network. Those are all indications or signals that we then bring in and say, that becomes the trigger to this established contract going live and beginning its billing process. Right. right, and of course that's where tools like convergent mediation and others kind of bring that to the fore, right? Exactly right, that idea that I need to be able to do that in real time, because in some cases I might be providing, in the case of someone like a Reliance Geo, right, they're providing, you know, um, services that are prepaid. And so I want to get a customer active as soon as they can be so they can start using the services and you know using up their prepaid amounts. Those all become really key towards driving that behavior and that relationship. You don't you don't exactly. want a device sitting on a dock for three months or someone not scheduling an install or a device not being activated because you've laid out the equipment costs up front that you're hoping to recoup in the downstream subscription, that's not going to happen until it's active. Exactly. Same true, Sunil, of, of the media space, right? Where they've they've signed up, but now you need them to activate and, and do some of those pay for uh, programs, right? Correct. And uh, how how we are handling the changes also, that's another critical part, uh, uh, not just in the media industry, but uh, other industries too. I mean, once the setting up of the service is one aspect of it, and then it goes into a, a regular subscription uh, billing, but then there could be changes, like you may have to stop subscription for a couple of months, and how do you uh, restart the subscription after that uh, exactly. uh, brief period in between. So these kind of change management processes are also in a critical aspect. And that, when you talk about tools there, that's also tying in the concept of entitlements, right? So entitlement management says, I'm now spinning up in my charging system, the billing relationship on how much they're going to, to pay for this, but what do they actually have rights to? What, what am I tracking? If someone's to call customer service, what is the system of record to say where I stand in terms of what software release I'm running or you know how, how many more uh, activations do I get under my plan? Those are all notions of entitlements that may or may not have a direct monetary impact, but are things that I need to, to challenge uh, as we go forward to manage that relationship with the customer. Exactly. So, you know, we, we see that this area has a lot of complexity. So we're kind of just out of time. So I want to thank you guys again for just a great, robust conversation. Hopefully it's stimulated some thoughts in the folks that are on here. Um, wrapping up quickly or, or wrapping up, I think the point being customers are now driving how they want to react and interact with us and transact with us. Uh, and, and us is the B2B, B2C model doesn't really model what matter. We need to adopt our business models uh, and pick a solution uh, or combination of solutions that adapts and meets those needs. Uh, 
Um, you can see, and we talked about how SAP and Bramasol offer a host of ways to approach it holistically, but you can also see that you can bite off little chunks. Today, we talked specifically about the solutions uh, bundling, the solution development, the integration of all of that. You can adapt and focus on one piece uh, now. In wrapping up, the only thing I would say is this is happening now. Ken, Sunil, they are very busy people um, and they're busy because so many customers out there are changing their business models and moving to these new monetized subscription models um, that you know it's important that you act now, reach out to partners like Bramasol, reach out to SAP, learn more, we're here to help. So Ken, Sunil, I just wanna be, do a big thank you for you guys. Uh, I've really enjoyed this conversation. Hopefully you've, you've enjoyed it. Uh, and we look forward to uh, talking with everyone in the future. Thank you, John. All Thanks, right, John. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. All right.